welcome. Welcome to the show, everybody. I want to remind each of you to like and subscribe on YouTube. We are Film Talk Radio. I'm joined by a very special guest today. Lee Zlatoff is the author of The MacGyver Secret, also the creator of the hit television series MacGyver, and the writer-director of The Spitfire Grill. Lee, nice to see you, Lee. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Jacques. Good to see you, too. Well, I just love the book, The MacGyver Secret. I think it's a simple way of tackling something very complicated. And so I I, I love to talk a little bit more about uh, some of the other things you've done. But since we haven't done a show yet about the book, let's uh, unpack it a little bit. So I think, the uh, yeah, the... The thing that stands out to me first and foremost is the power of your subconscious mind. So it's more powerful and more accessible than we think. Is that right? Absolutely. So the the simple premise of the book, and I literally stumbled upon this process, um, being a television writer where I had to produce enormous amounts of creative material under ridiculously tight deadlines. And I I noticed that the best stuff always came to me when I was driving or taking a shower, not when I was sitting at my typewriter or computer, like trying to be creative, you know, it's like, and I asked myself, why is that? How come, how come the best stuff comes to me when I seem to be doing something other than trying to be creative? And the answer was that the real creative part of ourselves is our subconscious, not our conscious mind. We think that the subconscious is just this little thing that shows up every once in a while when we remember one of our dreams. But it turns out that, you know, like your heartbeat, your subconscious has been going 24-7, 365 days since at least the day you were born, if not before you were born. So it knows you better than anyone in your life will ever know you. It is vast, and a good way to compare this is Picture the size of my head on this screen right now. Let's say that's your conscious mind. And then pick whatever state you live in, like New Mexico. That's the size of your subconscious mind. You think, how is that possible? And you go, well, there are appearances and there are realities. I'll give you an example. It appears every morning that the sun rises and sets at night, and that we're standing still and the sun is rising, rising and setting. Well, we know that's just the appearance. The truth is the sun's not moving at all. We're moving. In fact, we're moving at a thousand miles an hour. It just doesn't feel like we're moving at a thousand miles an hour. The same thing is true. The appearance is that your conscious mind is where it all happens and that your subconscious is is that little thing that sometimes shows up. And it turns out it's the exact opposite. Your subconscious mind is the size of the sun and your conscious mind is the size of the earth. So it's, it's a big difference. And in that subconscious is pretty much everything you need to solve practically any problem you're facing, if you just know how to communicate with it. And that's what the book teaches you how to do with, believe it or not, nothing more than a pen and a piece of paper. You can learn to communicate directly with your subconscious. And that's what the book shows you how to do. But the truth was, it was just my own experience with trying to produce creative material and discovering that the best way to do it was, believe it or not, I put a whiteboard in my office in Hollywood and a workbench. And when I was tasked with coming up with stories or writing a script, I would, you know, I would go to the whiteboard and I'd say, I need an idea for an episode. And then rather than stand there and rack my brain and try to be creative, I go to that workbench and I build paper models, you know, like build the Empire State Building out of paper or, you know, I built every monument they had a model for. I built the Taj Mahal. I built, you know, <laughs> the Great Sphinx at Giza. I built the Statue of Liberty. I built a Brooklyn Bridge made out of paper. Jacques, trust me, no one needs a Brooklyn Bridge made out of paper. <laughs> but I didn't do it because I needed the models. I did, it because I did the same thing as driving or taking a shower would do which is it occupied my conscious mind so my subconscious mind could work on the problem. And then after working on that model for 45 minutes or an hour, I'd go back to the board, I'd look at my question, and I'd literally start writing anything at all. I mean, I'd write the Star Spangled Banner words. I'd I'd write what I wanted for lunch. And within like 30 seconds, the ideas would just 
pour out of me right onto the whiteboard. And I went, this is amazing. This is like magic, you know? And and it made me both both very productive and very successful in Hollywood. And as you're uh, working on the model or doing the task to distract you from what you're trying to accomplish, you don't think about the question on the whiteboard at all. In fact, you refrain from thinking about it. And that seems counterintuitive, but I think being counterintuitive is a big part of your process. That, that's exactly right. The best thing to do is to forget about the question entirely because you've now tasked this massive part of your consciousness to work on the problem and get out of the way. It's like, you know, you've heard the expression, get out of your own way. That's what I did on a regular basis. I would just get out of my own way. I'd say, here's the problem. I'm not going to think about it. You guys in the back room, whatever you want to call them, you know, some people call it their higher self. Some people call it God. I don't care what you call it. It doesn't care what you call it. You can call it anything you want. It knows you're telling it what you want by writing it down. Okay. And so then, yes, it is very counterintuitive. I sit there and work on the model. I focus on the model and nothing else. And when I come back, what I need is there for me. And that's exactly what the veterans found. Even to things like, I lost my silver knife and I, I have, and I can't find it. I'd say, well, why don't you ask your subconscious where that silver knife is? Because it knows, it records everything. It knows where that knife must be. So they go, okay, where's my silver knife? And then they'd go for a walk or they'd go fishing or they'd do whatever they wanted to do. And when they came back, they go, oh my God, I know where the knife is now. <laughs> and they'd go, this this, how does this work? And I go, I can't tell you how it works. I just tell you that it works. The poet William Blake said, I myself do nothing. The Holy Spirit accomplishes all through me. Yeah, I'm not claiming that the, that, that what I've stumbled on is do. Okay. I think people, particularly technical people and creative people, engineers, you know, coders, artists have been doing some form of this they just didn't necessarily understand or articulate the process that way i mean einstein said something he said the intuitive mind is a sacred gift and the rational mind is a faithful servant we have created a society that honors the servant and has forgotten the gift okay and and so yeah you know einstein used to do this thing where he when he was trying to come up with an answer to some, you know, problematic question or conceptual problem, he would sit in a chair, he put pebbles or a rock in his hand, and he'd slowly start to kind of drift off thinking about the problem until he was literally on the edge of sleep. And then when his hand would relax, the rock would fall and hit the floor. And he was hoping that it would wake him up and he'd catch the answer. Okay. So on some level, he understood that the answer wasn't coming from his rational mind. It was coming from what he called his intuitive mind. All right. It's had lots of names over the years, but it, it's, you call it in your MacGyver, you call it subconscious. It doesn't matter what you call it. It's that part of your consciousness that you are, by definition, not aware of when you're awake. Lee, tell me about ingenuity. That's who MacGyver is. That's who you are. And uh, being creative in that way. Uh, wh what is ingenuity? Well, so there are sort of three core principles of the MacGyver character. Uh, and you can go to MacGyver.com and sort of see everything we're up to. Um, but those core principles, is first of all, MacGyver didn't use a gun. So, you know, Core principle number one is avoid conflict because conflict usually just leads to more conflict and it doesn't necessarily solve anything. Okay. Core two, the one you're talking about, ingenuity, creativity, resourcefulness. We translate that as how do you turn what you have into what you need? Okay. Which is something we're all having to do these days as individuals, as communities, as countries, as a globe. I mean, let's face it. I mean, literally, as we speak, Jacques, New York City is shutting down events because there's too much smoke from the 200 some odd wildfires in Canada. All right. It's like people, this is not going to get easier. It's only going to get harder. The truth is, though, we all have resources inside of us, enormous resources, both inside of us and outside of us. 
that as individuals, we can call on to start addressing some of these problems. And ingenuity is really a part of that. And if the MacGyver secret can help a thousand people, 10,000 people, a million people to come up with better solutions, then my life has been worthwhile. <laughs> so, so using this technique, and that's really all it is, is a technique, you can come up with better answers to whatever issues you've been confronting in whatever form they have. Again, I was recently dealing with veterans and they went, man, this stuff is painful and it's old. And I said, look, you don't have to go any deeper into this stuff than you want to. But if you're struggling, and it turned out the three biggest complaints that came up were, I have trouble sleeping or staying asleep. I'm really quick to anger more so than I want to be, like I'll snap at people, my wife, my kids. And the third thing was I get stuck a lot. I want to finish a project or start a project. And I can't seem to get there. No matter what I do, I, I seem to get distracted. So he said, okay, try seeing if asking, what is it I need to get a good night's sleep? What is it I need to do so that I'm not so quick to anger? What is it I need to do to get unstuck? And believe it or not, they all got answers. Literally people who had not been able to get to sleep without a struggle for years said, every time I write these questions down, I put my head on the pillow and I fall right to sleep. And I haven't been able to do that for a decade. Okay? And you go, great. Then it's working for you. Well, guess what? You get a good night's sleep. You're a lot more productive. You're a lot less likely to snap at somebody. And now the people who were stuck said, ah, I wrote my question down. How do I get unstuck? And they went, now I know how to begin. I just started, oh, do this first and then do this and then do that. I mean, and it just poured out of them. One of the participants had recently suffered a family tra tragedy. And he said, I can't retire when I was going to retire. I've got to redo my whole life plan right now. And he wrote down 17 questions. And believe it or not, over the course of two days, every one of those 17 questions were answered, okay? So you go, okay, this is the heart of ingenuity. You have the ability to come up with really helpful, productive solutions to anything you want to ask if you just know how to communicate with your own subconscious. In the book, you don't mention Dale Carnegie by name, but you mention how to make friends and influence people. He was working at the YMCA teaching and uh, he figured out that people needed a book on how to make friends and influence people. And so he wrote that book. And then the next thing he figured out was that people needed a book on how not to worry. And so in his book, I think it's called um, How to Stop Worrying and Start Living. He comes up with a method where you focus on the thing that you're worried about you then think about take it to its extreme and think what would be the worst case scenario and then you accept that and then you're you're free from worry and i was reading it going you know that's not going to work how is that going to work now i or at first after reading the book i used it all the time now i don't worry about anything at all with these kind of simple steps these simple methods you know you're able to move mountains and it also puts you in a place where you're this wildly successful TV writer, you're turning out shows faster than any of your colleagues can. And the bosses, the suits must be looking at you like, this guy's in his office building models. <laughs> what is the deal? The power of this method is doing something else, right? So. Well, yeah, that's the part of it is, as, as you said, asking yourself, what it is that you're stuck on, what it is you're looking for, what it is you want. Because, you know, we still have the basic sort of Neanderthal approach, which is the things I want are somehow all outside of me. And I have to go out there and hunt them down and kill them and skin them and throw them over my shoulder and hope that I get back to the cave before some bigger animal takes it away from me, okay? Well, guess what? We're not Neanderthals anymore, okay? Most of us, not all of us, but most of us 
don't have to struggle for to put food in our mouths, clothes on our back, shelter over our heads, okay? The truth is, in my experience, everything you want is already inside you if you know how to access it, if you know how to find it. And then you find it inside, and crazy as it sounds, it shows up outside of you. The phone rings, there's a knock on the door, the job you've always wanted, whatever it is, is available to you, not because you ran out there and hunted it down, but because you found what you were looking for inside yourself, and then the world was only too happy to hand it to you on a silver platter. I know this sounds crazy, but that's my experience. That was my experience in Hollywood. That's been my experience since. And part of writing The MacGyver's Secret was to go, look, I'm not unique. Other people can do this. Other people can use this. The things you want are available to you. They just don't necessarily happen to be outside of you. And that goes for relationship. You can look for, you know, you've heard the expression. It's very hard to love somebody else if you can't love yourself or to let somebody love you if you can't love yourself. So what does that mean? Does that mean, you know, you fawn over yourself all day long? No, it means you recognize who you are. You know, and when you can embrace your own self, it's a whole lot easier to let somebody else embrace you and to find somebody who you want to embrace. Tell me this, Lee, do you believe in a collective unconscious? Let's talk about what, what that means. And, and I think the short answer would be, I don't see any reason why there couldn't be a collective subconscious. So you're going back to a union idea, which is, okay, we all have an individual subconscious at least according to, to me and you right now, okay? And the MacGyver secret, because it works. Is there some plane or some way in which all those individual subconsciouses are connected? And therefore, can we somehow have access to answers that have nothing to do with our own experiences? I think, I think the answer is, I don't see why not. OK, if you stop and think about it, we seem to be separate individuals, mm -hmm. but it turns out we're really all connected. OK, I mean, you knock on a table, you think this is solid. But if you start looking at it closely, it's really just a bunch of atoms, most of which is empty space. Mm -hmm. OK, you go, but it's a table. How could it be mostly empty space? Well, guess what? Every solid thing, when you examine it closely, is mostly empty space and everything is vibrating. All of these atoms, the atoms in a rock, in an animal, the atoms in you, they're all vibrating. So while it may look like we're separate individuals, the truth is on some level, everything has to be connected, okay? Well, if you accept that on some level, everything has to be connected, then it's not that hard to accept that there might very well be a collective subconscious that all of us, if we know how, can both add to and take from, okay? That we are constantly, in a sense, contributing things. Sometimes we call it culture. Taylor Swift, okay? This is a phenomenon, right? She touches millions, if not hundreds of millions of people. But they are putting something in and they are getting something back. I don't see why there couldn't be a collective subconscious. Can I prove it to you? I cannot. You had touched on the subject of dreaming. I know Paul McCartney woke up with the entire tune for yesterday in his head almost exactly and then went to write it down. Uh, tell, tell me how that fits into your method. So it turns out that sleep can be what we call one of those incubation activities. So me working on those paper novels, paper models was an incubation activity. Okay? And the truth is, dreams are often where we can get the answers to the problem we want, or you can simply tell your subconscious before you go to sleep, write a problem down and say, I'm going to go to sleep, you're going to work on this while the rest of me is asleep, and when I wake up in the morning, you're going to have an answer for me. And I'll give you a perfect example of the same dreaming thing. Elias Howe, who is credited with inventing the sewing machine, right? OK, he was struggling to invent this machine. And of course, if you look at a typical needle, the eye of the needle is always at the top and the point is always at the bottom. Right. And he couldn't figure out how to make a machine 
where the needle could go down and come back up if, if the hole for the thread was always at the top. And he was struggling with this. So he went to sleep and he had this dream. And in this dream, he was beset by these Aboriginal natives. I don't know, they were at Amazon or Africa, okay? And they were all pointing spears at him and they were gonna, you know, throw them in a pot and cook them or something. And he noticed that all their spears had a hole at the point. And when he woke up from the dream, he went, oh my God, that's it. The hole doesn't go at the end of the needle. The hole goes at the tip of the needle. That way it can go down through the fabric, come right back up. I can make a machine to move the fabric over. And he automated the sewing process. And the solution came to him in a dream. So that is exactly what we're talking about, except that you don't have to get it in a dream. You can get it anytime you want, wherever you are, just by writing down the question, tasking your subconscious or inner MacGyver to work on it, do something else that preoccupies you, and then you come back, look at the question, start writing anything at all, and the answer will nine times out of 10 be there for you, whether it's a creative problem, a technical problem, or personal problem. You stress the importance of doing this writing with a pen and paper or a pencil and paper. Can you tell us about uh, how that works and the why that's better than typing or texting uh, when it comes to communicating with your subconscious? Yeah, so the, the, the MacGyver Secret book is actually co-authored by a, a PhD in cognitive psychology, I mean, uh, cognitive science and clinical psychology named uh, Colleen Seifert. And, and the bottom line is, and I don't know exactly why this is, but when you write something down in longhand, it somehow goes deeper into the neural pathways of your brain than if you type it. It will work if you type it, but for some reason, because typing is kind of mediated by something else, when you write it in longhand, it sort of sticks in your, in your thought process better for some reason. So... I, I can't, I, I'm not a neuroscientist. I can't explain to you why. I don't even know that neuroscientists could explain to you why. They just know if you write it down in longhand, it somehow goes deeper than if you just type it or if you just say it to yourself because you say lots of things to yourself and your subconscious doesn't know, okay, what am I supposed to focus on here? When you write it down, it's a way of making it physical and concrete so that your subconscious goes, ah, so this is the question you want me thinking about. It's like, yep, that's the question. Yeah, we've had uh, Julia Cameron on the show a few times, and she uh, wrote The Artist's Way, and one of the big parts of unlocking your creativity is writing morning pages, and they've got to be longhand, and you've got to do it uh, within 45 minutes of awakening in the morning. But I think you're in your book, you're, you advocate even more uh, the minute you wake up or as soon as you're between sleep and waking. That, that state is where you want to be to tap into your creativity. The sooner, I mean, listen, you wake up, you go to the bathroom, right? And the sooner you start writing for those answers, if you're using sleep as your incubation activity, the faster the stuff will come because it's closer to the surface. You know, I, in fact, I just read, there was a nice article in the New York times going into the details of REM sleep. Okay. REM sleep is when you dream and then there usually have a minimum of four to five periods of REM sleep every night. Okay. And then there's something called non REM sleep, which is basically deep sleep when your body is healing itself and the REM sleep, they believe is when you are processing all the stimuli that's happened to you during the day and you're now processing it against your entire, entire experience. And sometimes that results in dreams where it's trying to weave all that together. But the bottom line is your subconscious is going 24 seven, always has been, always will be until God bless you, you meet your maker. Okay. And, and that means that that cognitive, enormous cognitive ability is available to you if you just know how to tap into it. Let's kind of 
unpack that a bit. So you're speaking to your inner MacGyver and you're distancing yourself from yourself, right? Self-distancing. How do we ask our inner MacGyver for answers? You are acknowledging that there are two parts of your consciousness, that it's not just what I call the hamster wheel of your thoughts that start when you wake up in the morning and keep going until you put your head on the pillow and you finally fall asleep. You go, oh, there is another part of my consciousness. So let's, let's be clear. There's something that regulates your heartbeat and your all of your bodily functions. This is part of your subconscious, okay? It's integrating all of you, both mental and physical, all right? So the answer is, yes, you acknowledge that this consciousness of yours has more than one part. Crazy as this sounds, your subconscious is trying to help you all the time. It doesn't want to hurt you. It can't ever tell you to do something you don't want to do, okay? It, it's not going to do that. It wants to survive and thrive because it wants you to survive and thrive, okay? So it's this built-in ally, which is also the size of a Cray computer, that can offer you unbelievably productive answers to whatever it is you're trying to deal with. So in a sense, you're distancing yourself, but really what you're saying is, here's the problem I have. There's a part of me that can solve that problem, and it doesn't have to be my conscious mind. I got to go do something else. And there's only four activities that you really can't do as what we call incubation activities. Any physical activity will, will work. You can go for a walk. You can go for a run. You can walk the dog. You can do the dishes. You can vacuum the house. You can do a, a hundred different things. There's only four that won't work. You can't watch TV, too bad, but it doesn't work. You can't read, also too bad, but it doesn't work. You can't play super interactive video games like, you know, World of Warcraft or Duty of Honor or whatever it is, you know. You can play games like Tetris or Candy Crush, those are fine, but you can't do like first person shooter games. And you can engage in a lot of conversation, okay? Because all of those activities, believe it or not, require an enormous amount of subconscious processing. And so if you're doing those, then your subconscious goes, wait a minute, I'm, I'm busy processing this whole world over here for you. I, I can't really work on your problem effectively. You want me to work on your problem effectively? Do something stupid, you know, go for a run. You know, do the dishes, you know, work in the garden. Lee, tell me uh, about personal problems. Can I use the MacGyver secret to help me if I'm having personal problems? Absolutely. But there's a little thing to be aware of. So one of the things your subconscious does, again, believe it or not, is it tends to keep painful and traumatic experiences away from you. Because if every, everything that, pain, that was ever painful and traumatic in your life was in the forefront of your mind all the time, you would be unable to function. I mean, literally, you, just, you'd, you'd st you wouldn't be able to get out of bed, okay? So one of the jobs your subconscious has is to say, hey, Jacques, you know all that painful stuff that happened when you were a kid or yesterday or when your girlfriend broke up with you? I put all that stuff away so you don't have to see it all the time. So now you say, hey, why did my girlfriend break up with me? Did I do something wrong? What, why can't I sustain a relationship? First thing your subconscious is going to say is, hey, Jacques, are you sure you want to get into this? Because I've been keeping this on the down low. So, you know, it's not in your way all the time. Sometimes with personal problems, you have to ask more than once. You have to tell your subconscious, I am ready to look at this. And I am ready to hear the answers about this. So you ask more than once, sometimes two times, sometimes three times. But by asking more than once, your subconscious goes, okay, I get it, Jacques. You're really ready to look at this now. So I'm going to give you the answers that I think are going to help us both, okay? Which is maybe you need to be more patient. Maybe you need to listen more to your partner and not be the one who's always in charge, whatever it happens to be. That's not the point. And by the way, when we teach the MacGyver secret, we never ask people, what did you ask and what answer do you get? Mm -hmm. It's none of our business. All we say is, 
Did you get an answer? Did the answer seem helpful to you? Okay, is the process working? When we did this with the vets, I said to them, you don't have to share a damn thing, okay? Not your question, not the answer you got. All you have to say is, yeah, it's working. No, it's not working. I'm having a problem with this or I'm having a problem with that. None of that stuff is anybody, anybody's business but yours. And believe it or not, precisely because they had that, more often than not, we'd say, well, I want to tell you the question I asked and I want to tell you the answer I got. <laughs> because it allowed them to go, oh, I'm safe here, okay? Nobody's judging me and nobody's, you know, nobody's going to look down their nose because of whatever my problems happen to be. But the fact is, you can use this to solve any kind of personal problem. I'm having a problem with somebody at work. How do I handle that situation best, okay? Because the way I'm doing it is clearly not working. Or I don't like my boss. Does that mean I have to quit my job? Or is there a smarter way to deal with my boss, given the fact that I don't like the way I, they talk to me? Whatever it is. Personal problems, relationship problems, problems with your family, whatever it happens to be, the answers, again, I believe are all inside of you. If you just give yourself the opportunity to look at it and ask for those answers. So personal problems, not a problem. And the book has helped so many people. I think the testimonials in it are fascinating. So many people with these complicated problems or seemingly uh, detrimental um, or life-changing decisions that they're facing used this method and they sing your praises and thank you and call it simple but brilliant. And so uh, maybe a little bit about um, what, what can you tell us about some of the people who you've helped and then become friends with throughout the process? Well, listen, when you give somebody a tool and they go, this tool changed my life, it's hard not to suddenly have a bond with that person because they go, it was a book. I mean, you handed me this book, and this book was very easy to follow. I mean, it's a thin book. I probably should have brought one with me, but I didn't. Anyway. It, I, unfortunately, know, it, I got mine on Kindle this time, so I don't know who I gave my paper copy to. Again, if you go to MacGyver.com and just look for the MacGyver secret, you, you'll see it. and It's available on Amazon. But, but the, the bottom line is, when somebody hands you something and says, I don't have the answer, you have the answer, but this book might give you the key to how to get the answers from yourself that you want, okay? Because I don't have the answers for you. I only have the answers for me, okay? And that is both empowering people and freeing them in a way. You don't have to do what I tell you to do. All you have to do is try it and see if it works for you. It's very, it is, it's very gratifying to offer that to people because it's giving them the tools that they need to fix their own problems rather than telling them, well, if you don't believe in my God, then, you know, you're going to go to hell. Okay. It's like, no, it, it has nothing to do with that. You don't need to say any funny words. You don't need to chant. You don't need to do anything. All you need to do is write it down, go do something else, come back and see what your subconscious has to offer you. It's, it's like stupidly simple, but that's probably why it works so well, so. Well, and it's become a sort of superpower for you, uh, things, it's become a sort of superpower for you, things that you were before worried about or a task that seemed uh, very hard to tackle. Now knowing you can rely on your inner MacGyver has uh, emboldened you to feel like you can do anything. It has pretty much relieved the element of stress from my life entirely. Because if you know you can get a good answer, okay, then you stop stressing. I mean, I was in a very high stress situation 
And I turned out with using this to be the calmest guy in the room. And they went, how come this guy is so freaking calm all, all the time? You know, we're all tearing our hair out because we're afraid if we write a bad script, we're going to get fired. We write two bad scripts. We'll never work again. You know, and I went, guys, guys, it's just you, you're working yourselves over. You don't need to do that. OK, you you can use this method. And it took all the stress out of my life because I knew no matter what the project was I was handed, no matter what the deadline was, I could get it done mostly because I didn't have to get it done. My subconscious could get it done for me. And man, that was a game changer, absolutely game changer. And medical specialists will tell you the biggest killer in our modern world is stress. OK, I mean, stress exacerbates everything. You got a disease, you're stressed, it's only worse, okay? If you could relieve stress from your life dramatically, think how much healthier you might be. So if nothing else, you can use it just to de-stress yourself. <laughs> In that case, you can solve problems. I mean, listen, if you're a creative writer, it's great because, you know, it eliminates writer's block because you know, oh, all I got to do is say, what do I got to write next? Go wash the dishes or walk the dog or take a shower or whatever it is. Come back. And it's there inside of you waiting for you as soon as you hit the page. You know, it's like not that hard. Yeah. And God, that must be a great feeling to know that your stress is is able to be relieved or that it's just no longer you're no longer bound by being stressed out really modern life is by definition stressful you know i mean put aside all the issues with climate change and you know wars that are going on the, the truth is the world has never been in some senses in better shape than it is now by that i mean we now sustain over eight billion people on this planet most have food, most have water, most have shelter, most have some form of health care. That's never happened in the history of the world before. I mean, there are more people living now than have ever lived and died in the history of mankind that we know of. OK, so we're doing some things really well. We're not doing some other things so great. OK, our news, 24 hours news cycle, though, it's going to tell us everything that's going wrong because, you know, Triggering your fear response is a whole lot easier than triggering your hope response. And so if they want to catch your dime, as Paul Simon likes to say, or, or they want to get your eyeballs, they're going to say the scariest thing they could possibly say to you because that's going to get your attention. So it's easy to think the world is literally coming apart at the seams. Please just uh, tell me the latest news for Lee's Laptop. Sure. Well, the, the highlights <clears throat> are, as you said, we have... Uh, we have turned MacGyver into a musical, believe it or not, and and uh, we have now had two productions, and we're uh, we're in the process of gearing up to do our first full scale commercial production. But part of what makes this musical so unique is that in every performance we cast the lead role of MacGyver out of the audience, so we have a total novice is the star of the show. And we've had men, women, everybody from 18 years old to 81 years old, and doesn't really seem to matter. The audience seems to just get a blast out of it. So, and we don't pick somebody at random. We, when the audience is all in and seated, we have like a 10 minute audition. We ask for three or four volunteers of who wants to be MacGyver. And believe me, people show up in leather jackets with Swiss army knives and duct tape. They're ready to be MacGyver. And uh, since it's a musical, we make them act a line and sing a line and dance. And then by their applause, the audience decide who's going to get to be MacGyver. So we also, uh, at, uh, at the end of January, released the, uh, the album from the show. So you can uh, get that on all the, you know, Spotify and iTunes. And so the album's out there if you care to hear the songs. So. And uh, what's the name of the album so people can search for it? It's called MacGyver the Musical. <laughs> <laughs> Kidding. Catchy, huh? <laughs> the other thing, uh, really, the other two things I'm working on are, um, you mentioned the book, The MacGyver Secret, and we've just recently started to work towards a new edition of that book specifically for veterans. 
the last week of April, the first week in May, uh, we did our first pilot program with a bunch of veterans to see if it would help them in any way and really address some of the issues um, that veterans have in both adjusting to, you know, life, civilian life, and in dealing with issues like PTSD. The goal is to do enough of these pilot programs so that we have the material to then do a new edition of the MacGyver Secret Book specifically for veterans and their family. You no, know, I just would say if you're interested in any of this or want to follow all the other MacGyver projects, just go to MacGyver.com. That's where it's all living. So, And I appreciate you giving me the time shock and, uh, and asking the questions that you did. I think this was an awesome opportunity, and let's hope some people hear it and it helps them. Lee, the pleasure was all mine. Everybody, this was Lee Zlatov. The book is called The MacGyver Secret. You can get it at MacGyver.com, and we'll see you next week. Thanks.